I've been wanting to do a video discussing this mantra that I have been using as of late, protocols versus platforms, or some of you might have heard me or seen me write, protocols, not platforms. And this is a difficult one to explain. It takes a little bit of background, and so it's taken me a while to decide to finally sit down and talk about this. But I think that it's particularly timely now as we are coming into a situation where people are having to make a decision. And the decision that they seem to believe that they are making is either I acquiesce to something that either my health, my religion, my principles, my ideological background does not align with, or I lose my career, something that I have worked very hard at. I've seen this particularly coming from people who are, let's say, licensed and certified individuals within a particular professional framework. So pilots, people in the medical field, so nurses and doctors, other sort of uh, technical or professional types who say, look, I spent all of this time in school and then I spent all of this time getting, getting licensed and certified in one way or another. And, and now what are you asking me? You're asking me to uphold my principles and in that way, perhaps I have to give up this entire career that I have built for myself. And this career that I have built for myself within this particular framework. And it is this framework and the relationship between this framework and to the knowledge and skills that these people actually have that I want to speak. And this is the difference or the relationship between protocols and platforms. Because what we're seeing right now is we are seeing individuals who are, feel that they are making a decision between being on this platform, a platform, and being removed from this platform. We see these terms used literally when we're talking about, for instance, social media. That someone says, well, I can't, if I speak my mind, if I speak the truth in many cases, what I know to be the truth, and if I express that on this platform on which I have built my brand, my business, so this could be a social media platform, this could be a content delivery platform, YouTube would be an example of this. People who say, well, but if I say this, I'll lose my entire channel. And perhaps these individuals rely upon their channel or have built their even livelihood on this channel. And you could see that there is this exact same analog of, let's say, the nurse or the airline pilot who says, well, if I don't take the woke poke, there's no way that I can be an airline pilot anymore. In the same way that if I speak my truth, there's no way that I can be a YouTuber anymore. I will be removed. And I've built my life, my career. It keeps coming up. Oh, my children won't be able to eat. How will I support my family if I don't do this? It's not that I can't be a pilot anymore. They've got the skills to be a pilot. They learned the skills to be a pilot. It's not that I can't be a content producer anymore. They produce the content before they upload it to YouTube after all. No, it isn't that. It's something different. It's that I will be excluded from this platform, and without this platform, I don't know how to operate, or I don't know how to derive value from my particular skill set. And this is the trick, and this is the important thing to understand of what is it that these platforms do, and what is their relationship to the protocols, and what are these two things? So a protocol... The best way to think of a protocol, and, and you can actually use the term protocol interchangeably with the word language. It's language, custom, tradition, a set of standardized rituals, you might even say. Rituals are protocols. So the little ritual that we go through in every culture, please, thank you, and you're welcome. This is a protocol. It's also a protocol that you're expected to know. I spend quite a long time on that particular ritual in both my book, Render Unto Caesar, and in my Bitcoin Mystery School courses. It's so important. And if you understand that one, because we all participate in that one, 
As a matter of fact, if you have small children, teaching them to participate in that one, to get that first word, please, what's the magic word? Think about that, the magic word. It's an important protocol. But one of the things that you'll notice about this protocol is that please, thank you, and you're welcome are not owned by anyone. There's no copyright on these. There's no way that you can be removed from out of this. This is just something that everybody learns and something that everybody knows. It's available to everyone, and you're expected to know it. One of the examples that I use in terms of knowing platforms and protocols is the idea of the church. And within the church, the protocols would be something like the divine liturgy. So that is the ritual, the actual ritual that is taking place, the set of things, what is going to be the gospel reading and the epistle reading, what is going, how is the priest going to move? When is he going to do incense? What is he going to say when he provides the Eucharist? In Islam, the protocol, the, the, the biggest and most important of the protocols is what's taking place in uh, the schools called madrasas, which is what uh, Taliban means students. So the Taliban were students of madrasas in Pakistan. And what these students do in this school is they memorize the Quran in Arabic, in its exact language. And so what does this give you? What does this allow you to do? The same thing that a priest can do with the divine liturgy. We have no Orthodox church here, but we have had here in Saipan where I am, but we have had Orthodox priests come here and we can construct a chapel with the icons in the right place and a sort of a makeshift iconostasis and build some altars. And then we can do the, the services, the liturgy and baptisms and marriages. Those have all been done here. And this is the way that Christians have done this forever. And the same things go, same thing goes with one of these students who then after they have um, memorized the Quran is called the Hafiz. Hufaz is the plural. That during Ramadan, they would go to a place where the faithful are. And it could be a masjid, a mosque, or it could be elsewhere where there are faithful. And during that month, the expectation is that they will recite the entire Quran. And these individuals are actually very few and far between in the Islamic world nowadays. But you could see that if you have this protocol, be it the divine liturgy, be it someone has memorized the Quran, so long as you have one of these individuals left, you can reconstitute your entire society. The holy book is inside somebody's head. But the platform would be an actual physical location, a church, a masjid, mosque, an actual physical Quran, a physical Bible that then someone could come along and either destroy, which has happened so many times in history, an invading army comes and they destroy a church. Or the Hagia Sophia, the most holy cathedral in, in Christian history, is taken over when the Islamic forces of the, the Muslim Caliphate come in and is, is turned into a masjid. The Christians are no lo longer able to worship there. Or in Soviet Russia, where the churches are destroyed, demolished, blown up. Ancient churches, thousand-year-old churches are blown up by the Soviets. In those cases, in those cases, were your entire being, were the existence of your religion, of your faith, reliant upon the existence of that platform, reliant upon that this particular book would be in existence, that this particular building would be standing. That's a platform. And at times there would be a literal platform. In a temple, there's going to be a literal platform in some manner, and the, the most high will be placed on that, some representation of that will be placed actually upon that platform. And you say, well, the platform is destroyed. The church is destroyed. So therefore, our faith is destroyed. And there are some faiths, historically, where that has been the case. Where they have, <laughs> wasp, where they have absolutely had to have a particular platform, a particular temple, a particular location. And all their enemies have had to do to, to decimate them. 
is to destroy that location. But these very resilient and, and perhaps we could even say anti-fragile faiths like Christianity, like Islam, they're able to exist because it's the protocol that matters. So long as we have the liturgy, so long as we have a Hafiz, we can reconstitute, we can rebuild the church. He can recite and we can copy down the Quran again. And as a matter of fact, for much of Christian history, that was the job of monastics, of monks in monasteries, was to take the books, the scripture, and spend their lives making copy after copy after copy. The protocol is the language. The protocol is the means of creating the paper, going out and getting the paper, or the vellum, which is animal skin, that they would write on because it's much stronger. Being able to mix the, the ink yourself, being able to create the pen, being able to write the calligraphy, being able to do the illumination. This is the protocol. But what we have reached and what we always end up reaching, because this is the story of also the Tower of Babel, is that when a society gets to a place where the protocol is sufficiently developed, there emerges a natural inclination, a natural instinct. And it's a good instinct in the beginning. It's very virtuous. And the idea is something like this. Well, we all know how to do this thing, but we don't all need to be doing this thing. And as a matter of fact, some of us do this thing much better. In economics, we would call this comparative advantage. Some of us do this thing so much better than the others, so they should just focus exclusively on doing that, and then they can provide the service to the rest of us. One of the things that you get, economics just simply lays this out, we know this to be the case, is you get what's called economies of scale. When you get the best people to focus and specialize on a particular thing that they do well. The price of that good or service being offered steadily declines as they're able to offer it in bulk, in mass, at, in more efficient manners. Now, the trade-off is that this does centralize that product or service. And we saw this with the Walmartization of America. Business is a protocol. Retail is a protocol. It wasn't like there was something special about setting up a store and selling. People had done this forever. There are ancient markets still, souks in the Middle East that have been, that have been in existence. I mean, with the recent war, some of them got shut down, some were bombed, but that had been in existence for thousands of years and, and slowly came back and are coming back. And they started from, well, somebody's got something to sell, and they set up in the town square. In Greek, they called this a, the agora. They set up in the town square, and they sell their wares. And over time, they're there all the time, so perhaps they build a structure. And over time, over generations, as they continue to sell whatever their good or service is, they, they add on to that structure, and then it becomes wood, and then brick, and then it's a store. And we get this idea. And so you have the store as a protocol. And before Walmart, you would go into small town America for the most part. And let's say even if we're talking about before, maybe the malls or whatever, but the malls were a transition to Walmart. You would go and you would see bunches and bunches of small stores, small independent stores. And if you come to a place like Saipan, it's maybe one of the last places in America where that's absolutely the case. There is no Walmart here. There are no chain stores here. If I go down the street, there's an independent grocery store owned by somebody, and next door there's even another grocery store that may carry similar things, but has a little bit of difference. Literally next door, owned by someone else. And the restaurants are the same way, and the bars, and every business is that way. But Walmart was able to offer very, very low prices because Walmart is a platform. It's a retail platform. This is what you should see. It's a standardized way of doing all of the things that all of the retailers did 
in small town America from the, the bank to the pharmacist, to the grocer, to the clothing store, to the hardware store, to the toy store, to the electronics store, even to the optician, to the barber, all of them in one convenient location. And because all of these locations were the same, and because they had so many, they were able to purchase their supplies that they were going to sell, their merchandise, in bulk. And because they were able to purchase in such bulk, they were able to begin to build a platform. And now Walmart is not just a retail platform, it's also a shipping platform, a logistics platform. This is their big move. The trade-off is the retail protocol is forgotten. Individuals in small town America who might have started small businesses, who might have started a little shop where they sold something, now actually just have to go and work at Walmart. Or what's coming now, the Amazon warehouse, which is quite clearly another platform. And what happens if you are a producer, a manufacturer, and you, you make a product, and I've witness this myself with companies that I've uh, built and been a part of, and then you get the ability to sell in Walmart. Well, 99% of your sales are going to be in Walmart, and eventually you might even, in some cases, depending on the size of your company and what product you sell, you might just stop even worrying about selling to anybody else. It might not be worth it. But then what happens if Walmart decides to drop your product, which I've seen happen? This is an existential problem for your business. And this is the nature of platforms. And like I say, this is the Tower of Babel. This is building the tower to the sky. But then what happens when the tower crumbles? The people are scattered in all the different languages. There's no cohesion anymore because all of the cohesion was no longer around the protocol but it was around the platform. That was the totem around which people were circling. They were circling the church building. They weren't circling the divine liturgy. Because if they're circling the divine liturgy, well, the church building could go somewhere else. If they're circling the Quran, whether there's a masjid here or not, or a particular building that is the masjid, is sort of inconsequential. It's sort of inconsequential to their overall faith. You can always rebuild the building. What would happen and what is about to happen now when we see uh, people in uh, red states in America, rural red states in America, who say, well, we don't have, uh, you know, I don't see anybody with masks around here and I don't see... Uh, you know, I, nobody, nobody's uh, getting, the, getting the woke poke, and none of, no people are doing that. And I say, just wait. Wait until Walmart, and they will, they are going to, institutes the woke poke passport. And you can't get into Walmart unless you got a mask on. They'll be done with the mask unless you got your card, unless you got your mark. Card in your app, and you can't get into Walmart without it. Watch that whole thing change. And then when Amazon adds it as well, and it's tied to your account, and you can't use your central bank digital currencies unless you've done it as well, watch that whole thing change. And why? Why? Because people have become reliant on the platforms. And the other thing about platforms is, as platforms are totalitarian, they're totalitarian, meaning they try to absorb and subsume everything. Think about Walmart. Think about Walmart. Every, could this go in Walmart? Could we put a bank at Walmart? Could we check your eyes in Walmart? Right? Could we cut your hair in Walmart? Could you eat in Walmart? Could we do groceries in Walmart? This isn't how Walmart didn't start with groceries. Walmart didn't start with banks in it. Walmart didn't start with opticians in it. Pharmacy? And more and more and more. Amazon started out selling just books. Think about what they do now, all the way down to groceries, Whole Foods. 
platforms are totalitarian. Anything that they can bring into the platform, they bring into the platform. This is the Tower of Babel. Building a tower to heaven includes everything. And so when you have built your life reliant upon the platform and you are excluded into the wilderness, you have nothing, no tools. If you're, you're living and what you're pursuing is, how can I get more views on YouTube specifically? Not can I, how can I build a bigger audience? Because for all of these uh, YouTubers who have uh, 100,000 or hundreds of thousands of, of viewers or followers, ask them about their mailing list. Ask them how many of these people they can directly contact via email, which is a protocol and the most basic protocol of the internet. Ask them. They're going to say zero. None. They don't have it. They don't have it. And so this is the thing to consider. And this is why I say that the time is now to understand the protocols. Because if you are watching this video on YouTube, I can tell you what's happening. You are downloading an MP4 file. But I have free software that I'm using right here that I'm using to capture the audio and video and turn it into an MP4 file. And I certainly know how to put up a server. I've, I've done it throughout my career and serve you that MP4 file. But YouTube does it for free. And YouTube might even monetize my video. But if I build my entire livelihood within the platform, then I am going to suffer when I am removed from the platform. And because of the threat of that suffering when I am removed from the platform, I am going to change my behavior. I'm going to change my behavior so that I am not removed from the platform. And we began to see this with content, but it's the exact same thing that's happening when you're thinking, oh, uh, maybe I should, uh, maybe I should take this poke. And the people who are holding water for you at this moment. The people saying, well, not everybody can, not everybody can afford to, not everybody can afford to be kicked from the platform. They have kids to feed. But what moves did you make for the, for the, your entire life to provide yourself anything less than that? This is too big to fail. You say, well, if the grocery stores all went away, I wouldn't know how I would get food. Have you ever planted a, a food plant? Was anybody stopping you from doing that? And this is what individuals need to consider. So now is the time that we are going to see a split. Because the platform is totalizing itself. This is what you have to understand. If you want to ride on this platform, you have to understand that now what is happening is the platform is going to change drastically. What is expected of you and what you are able to, to receive from the platform is going to change drastically because they've got you by the short and curlies, clearly. And that's a bad place for you to be. You have no ability to negotiate, do you? But it's not too late. It's a lot later than you think, if you haven't figured that out. But it's not too late to change your orientation. It's not even a matter of having the skills. It's a matter of having the orientation that allows you to acquire them. Because the other thing that the platform wants to do the nature of the platform to protect itself is that it must eliminate your ability to even know that the protocols exist. It must eliminate your ability to be able to use the same protocols that it used to build itself. I'll give you a prime example. When they put people on these ventilators in these hospitals, they have to sedate them. They sedate them with fentanyl. Fentanyl is a prescription drug made by the pharmaceutical companies. But the making of fentanyl, the creation of fentanyl, is a protocol that any sufficiently competent chemist can make. 
given the right materials. And so the illegal fentanyl that's coming in, that is fundamentally the exact same thing that they are shooting these people up with that is prescribed by doctors within this platform. The illegal stuff that's, for instance, on the streets of Philadelphia like crazy and moving on to the streets of, of every city in America, the zombie fentanyl, that's made by chemists who are being paid by the cartels in Mexico who are getting their raw materials to do it shipped to them from China, not illegal materials. So even this most holy to the Church of Woke, these most holy scientists, the pharmaceutical creators, that everybody is waiting with bated breath for them to say, oh, what is the next thing that I get to inject into my body that is untested? Even those individuals are just operating off protocols that then they patent and they will prosecute you if you have the skills to do it yourself and you decide you're going to do it yourself. This is the game. So at a certain point, now even your ability to learn that such protocols exist is going to be steadily diminished. You're already seeing it. So now is the time. Now is the time, not just for yourself, but for others to take the orientation that you are going to move forward and be oriented towards the protocols themselves to learn what you can, to be of value to others who are learning what they can, and to reconstitute a community of individuals, not less technological. We don't need to go back to Amish times. We need to embrace and utilize the technology that is being used against us. And that is being used by the platforms themselves. And the answer is not to make new platforms. Because <laughs> all that will happen is those platforms will either be purchased or they will be put out of business by the existing platforms. You need to move to protocols which are not buildings that can be demolished. These other free speech platforms that people, after they get kicked off of YouTube, go and post their videos to, those will all be going away soon. Those are just churches being built. It's the protocol that matters. So that even if there's one individual left, it can all be reconstituted. Now, this is not for everybody. But then again, being free is not for everybody, as we can see. But if you're listening to this, it's probably for you. And so this is what it means. Before you are exiled from the platforms, before the decision becomes either take that exile or take the poison, reorient yourself. Reorient yourself. Give yourself the opportunity to be human. Give yourself the opportunity to use the knowledge that those who seek to control you are using, to use their tools, to use their weapons, and for you to use it to better yourself, not to enslave yourself, but to free yourself, to loose your chains. <laughs>